Greetings, Emmett here from Reading for Wisdom. Today we're going to look at a really cool book that um, takes us into a snapshot in history. A snapshot that looks at a particular historical epoch, but one that has great lessons for us today, great ongoing lessons, because it relates to an event that has economic consequences, political consequences, social, tax, business consequences, and health consequences, and consequences for public order. The incident that we're talking about is the early 18th century gin craze, um, featured in England, uh, particularly down in London, and it's a tale that has a uh, real relevance and lessons for us today. And the medium that we're going to think about, uh, the gin craze, is this really neat book by Patrick Dillon, The Much Lamented Death of Madame Geneva. Now, of course, the Madame Geneva of the title is gin. So the spirit gin that uh, came to England largely uh, via Holland and um, the term Geneva uh, is a Dutch term derived from juniper. And the juniper berry, of course, is where uh, some of the early forms of gin, and gin to this day, derive some of its special flavorings. More on that uh, a little bit later. Um, and uh, but by the time it got into English modern uh, contemporary sort of uh, parlance, um, it became gin, shortened to gin. And the gin craze is um, really a fascinating story. Dylan uh, begins the tale with uh, alchemy. Alchemy, the science of transforming base substances into something magical like gold. And uh, distillation, the science of distillation, which um, has been around really since uh, ancient Egyptian times, but it was only really in the um, first, at the end, re really the end of the first uh, millennium of the modern era, that the art of distillation uh, began to become more commonly known. And it spread beyond alchemists, uh, who were really the first uh, scientists, the first modern scientists. And once the art of distillation became uh, really um, sort of well known and it became uh, into the hands of uh, business people, into the hands of distillers, um, approximately in the uh, 16th, uh, 17th and of course the early 18th century, um, that uh, really it caused a revolution in drinking habits. It caused a revolution in business. And the, most of the book here is focused on that gin craze. A um, bit of background information. Um, the William of Orange uh, in the Glorious Revolution, uh, where he took the English throne uh, with a bit of force, uh, but not too much because uh, most of the people, the Protestant people of England certainly were behind him, came in, uh, uh, took on the throne of England, with his uh, wife uh, Mary, and they set about um, bringing some interesting changes to society. One of those changes was um, uh, relating to France. Uh, France was the great uh, enemy of England and uh, Holland uh, at the time, and one of the things that um, William was determined to do was try and economically hurt the French. So one of the first things he did was slap a tax on brandy. Of course, brandy, as you know, distilled wine. But he also taxed other wine imports into England. And England was a great wine-consuming nation at the time. And he also promoted the uh, consumption and the distilling of gin. And this was a, a relatively cheap uh, spirit to make. And um, a lot of English people had already become familiar with uh, this spirit gin. And that was from the wars uh, of the time uh, throughout the continent of Europe. And um, spirits were used to fortify men before they went into battle. Hence, of course, the term Dutch courage from gin. So gin, uh, quickly, as I said, in the late uh, 
um, 17th century, early 18th century, uh, gained a foothold in uh, England. Initially, it was largely regulated, uh, sort of licenses were given out to uh, distillers, and it was a fairly regulated affair. However, uh, the English Parliament uh, reduced some of these regulations, and all hell broke loose. Uh, what we see socially um, in England of the time is lots of smaller distillers getting in on the action, quality controls uh, dropping, and gin being widely available to every man, woman, child, and their dog. And um, drunkenness and productivity and great social concerns uh, were the result. And the book has uh, covers a lot of the period where people are grappling what to do about this real curse. And the great thing about this whole episode, and uh, Dylan admirably lays this out, is the contemporary lessons that we can learn from the gin craze, because not everything was as it appeared. Uh, even though we read so many uh, texts from the time that uh, show us this misery, the great misery from uh, gin drinking, and this is uh, famously encapsulated by the picture behind us, uh, which is by the uh, great uh, journalist and polemicist and publicist and engraver Hogarth. And what we see on one side of the picture is Beer Street. And Beer Street is a jolly fine place. And you can see from the engraving that everything is prosperous and things are going nicely. And these are people who consume beer. Gin Lane, on the other hand, is an awful looking place. Uh, the very famous uh, central uh, character, the mother, uh, obviously very, very drunk, uh, with her child falling to its death, uh, actually based on a, a real incident. So there's a social tale, there's a very powerful morality tale there from Hogarth. However, Hogarth was encouraged to, and shall we say paid, to uh, develop that picture and publicize it. And it was to support his friend Henry Fielding's um, uh, act of parliament that he wanted to bring in uh, to regulate and suppress the gin trade. And uh, this was being done with the support of the beer brewers. So there was um, concern by these beer brewers uh, that you know, gin was taking away their trade, it was um, reducing the uh, lucrativity of their profession, and of course they wanted that suppressed. Now we have some very, very similar um, monopolistic and business concerns today uh, when it comes to the prohibition on certain types of uh, pleasurable or addictive um, products. Um, another thing that has to be remembered about the gin trade is that it did uh, happen in a time when cities were growing, um, and cities were growing at an exponential rate. Uh, London was uh, tripling in size, soon to become the biggest city in the world, and there was an influx of people coming in from the countryside, and they lived in squalid, dreadful conditions, and to a lot of them, gin was, it was an escape, it was uh, a release. It was something to take them away from the squalor that they were living in. And of course, uh, a lot of business people wanted to keep them in that, uh, keep them in their place, keep them drugged. Uh, some incidents we see here in the book is where employers are feeding gin to their employees to keep them sort of satisfied, but also charging them for it. So that increased the uh, misery uh, at the end of the day, you, you finish a working week, uh, which was a very long uh, week, and uh, you had more, no more money left for your family because you'd been drinking on the job at the behest of your employer and um, paying him for uh, that privilege. So it's an exciting tale, a heady brew, and uh, Dylan uh, really, uh, every page has a fascinating uh, little vignette, uh, fascinating fact. And the book hurdles along, as I said, it's primarily concerned about that uh, period uh, up until 1751, when Parliament eventually brings regulation in. Did it 
do any good? Did it bring change? Not really is the message that uh, Dylan um, gives to us. Um, gin still remained. Uh, the, the craze itself um, almost had uh, sort of boiled down. But that could have had as much uh, to do because of various different other economic and social things going on as the suppression of the gin trade itself. Gin, of course, stayed um, a popular aperitif. Uh, uh, still remained mother's ruin uh, for many a time until uh, probably in the early 20th century, certainly uh, Victorian era, where it got a little bit, uh, a little bit, shall we say, more uh, top drawer. And we can think about characters like um, the great Gatsby, Jay Gatsby, uh, a, a firm consumer of the uh, gin martini, uh, the cocktail era. And uh, fair to say today, uh, gin, uh, a good old gin and tonic, uh, one of my favorite drinks certainly, is um, a very respectable um, uh, tipple. Apart from the great history lesson this is, the great insight into a wonderfully interesting uh, period of uh, English and European history. The book provides real food for thought. And in the epilogue, uh, Dylan really tackles the idea of the war on drugs, the war on drink, social panic, moralizers and people who want to uh, impose their will on society on largely ordinary people and the difficulty and complexity of regulating human life and he uh, all the examples in the book uh, in the epilogue he really uses to show how difficult it is to do one measure can create some other social problems uh, unintended consequences, which is a great law that all lawmakers and policy makers should always keep in the back of their mind. Um, he's not a moralizer, he's not a sermonizer. He can see uh, the glass as half full and half empty and uh, really uh, balances quite a complex issue in uh, a very readable, accessible way. Lovely book, highly recommended. If you enjoyed this review, please do give us a like. And if you enjoy the books that we're reviewing on this channel, please do subscribe. Come over to readingforwisdom.com where there's much more to entertain. Cheers.